Gig economy companies like Uber want you to believe working for them will bring in the cash as they continue to fight against state laws that would offer employment protections to their workers. A man cannot live on side hustle alone. One food delivery driver named Smithson Michael went viral this week for sharing his experience. You know, I wish people knew what it was like to deliver for Uber Eats, Postmates, DoorDash, all these companies. I just spent an hour driving around for a dollar and 19 tip. I mean, would it hurt y'all to tip us, throw us five dollars? I got a dollar and 19 tip and a two dollars from the app. What's that? And these are essential services. I just wish people knew what it was like. I wish they understood what it was like to drive for these services. Uber Eats has not commented on the man's video, but joining me now to discuss Dorothy Brown, tax professor at Emory University Law School and author of The Whiteness of Wealth, and Dorian, Water, uh, Dorian Warren, co-president of Community Change and co-chair of the Economic Security Project. Thank you all so very much. Uh, this, is a, this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. As a college professor at Morgan State University, I have a lot of students who are in this gig economy. I have a lot of students who are spending more gas than they're getting back from these apps. And, and Dr. Brown, I want to start with you. There's, there's data out that shows that like 69 percent of these food service drivers are people of color, are racial or ethnic minorities. What does that mean about the appeal of these apps and the desperation of communities of color for flexible, affordable work? It means if we had better options, we wouldn't be doing this. No one wants to drive around for $1.19 and $2 on an app. And the people who are benefiting are the shareholders and the CEOs of these companies who lobby to make sure that these gig workers are not treated as regular employees, but independent contractors, which really hurts the workers. Doran, there was a study uh, last year that talked about the fact that you know, when we initially got Uber and Lyft, it was the idea of like, hey, this is going to democratize everything. It, it counterbalances some of the racism that we saw with taxi cabs. But what we're seeing is studies have shown that prices are actually hiked when people are trying to move into black and brown areas with Lyft or Uber. I mean, are, are these sort of gig economy jobs part of our racial justice fight? Absolutely, Jason. It is always about racial justice linked to economic and gender justice. And just to go back to first principles, listen, all work has value and all working people have rights, full stop. Every person who works should have a living wage, should have safe working conditions, the fundamental right to join together with people to improve working conditions. And as Professor Brown just said, what we know is these company CEOs, particularly of Uber and Lyft and many others, let's include Walmart and Amazon, by the way, can't let them off the hook. They are buying politicians to aid and abet their efforts to make more profit. So if you look at the state of California, for instance, in 2019, the state said these independent contractors who work for these gig employers should be employees. Right. What did Uber and Lyft do? They spent $200 million for a ballot <laughs> initiative to basically take away the rights of workers. $200 million, think about that. What is behind that? What is, who does that serve? Not the workers and not especially workers of color. Dr. Brown, I want to add to this. What would be some of the challenges? You know, I, I, I go down the street, even in the middle of this pandemic, you know, and you see that car that has like four stamps in the window, right, of all the places they work for, Lyft and Uber Eats and, and, and Uber and Grubhub and Postmates and everything else like that. What are some of the structural challenges that gig economy workers face if they ever try to unionize? Is it just because they're all treated as independent contractors, as Dorian sort of mentioned, or also because it's very hard with work that people may not do frequently for them to realize that they have common concerns? Well, it's it's coming up against a well-funded companies, right, that have lobbyists and workers don't have lobbyists. And when they try to form unions, as we've seen with Amazon, the company engages in really uh, severe anti-labor practices. So it's hard, you know, it's a David and Goliath instance where David had a better shot than the workers do. <laughs> and, and, and something I want to add to this, there were a lot of commercials, I saw them here in D.C., I've seen them in different places, that talked about the fact that 
this isn't just affecting the people doing the deliveries, but oftentimes these gig economy jobs, these delivery services take a huge chunk out of small restaurants, right? And cut into their profits. So it's not just hurting people on the front end, it's hurting people on the back end as well. But I, I want to put up this, this data. Now, look, we can't confirm, NBC can't confirm all of this information from ProPublica, but they have an initial report that suggests that large numbers of multimillionaires in this country uh, are not paying taxes. Now, I want to be clear. NBC News has not independently verified the information. ProPublica says they are not disclosing how it obtained the tax information. ProPublica does not allege any of the people in their story did anything illegal. I want to make sure we make that clear. But just really quickly, what are you all's thoughts on the fact that the people behind these companies are also possibly, we're not sure, possibly playing negligible taxes? Uh, we'll start with Dr. Brown, and we'll go to Dorian. Well, it's obvious that we need systemic overhaul of our tax laws. You know, what my book talks about is how the tax system advantages rich white Americans and disadvantages black Americans. And here we see in this report, and it's no surprise that the top highest earners who are rich white men, and I will point out that ProPublica didn't talk about the race angle, but it's everywhere in the story. They are paying very little taxes legally because the system was designed by rich white men for other rich white men to pay less in taxes. So what a surprise. Here it is. Dorian? And Jason, I just have to say, there was a study um, that showed before the pandemic, one in two fast food workers required public assistance to survive. Why? Low wages, poverty wages. So think about that. We should be angry that we are subsidizing through the government the low-wage business model that, yes, you and I pay our taxes, all of us pay our taxes, but we're supporting the wealthy few getting richer while they pay no taxes. And as Professor right. Brown mentioned, this has racial and gender dimensions in terms of justice and equity. Right. Because when I look at this, when I think of, of the average driver, most of these people have been it's, it's almost like it's almost like for profit colleges. They've been suckered into these commercials. It's like, that's right. All you got to do is get your Honda Civic out there and you can make you can make enough for a down payment on a home. You can make enough to, to put your kids through private school. Very rarely do people make enough extra money, given the cost of these businesses to actually get ahead. So it, very quickly, Dorian, look, if you were in a position of power, if you were brought in as sort of a, a business ethics consultant uh, at one of these gig economy companies, Uber or Lyft right now, what's the first thing you would tell them to change to make these more human-centered and equitable companies as far as their workers? Respect the fundamental rights and dignity of all people and workers, first and foremost. You know, many of the gig workers who work for delivery service can't even access bathrooms at the restaurants where they're picking up deliveries to wow. bring a lot of us our foods. So there is like a dignity and justice issue here. But then secondly, we have to change the rules of the game. There's the PRO Act in Congress in terms of providing workers the right to join together. There are all the tax policy reforms that Professor Brown has outlined in her book. There's the range of policies. Policies, boosting unemployment insurance, not taking it away, as you mentioned in your previous segment, the expanded child tax credit, stimulus checks. These are things that allow people to survive. And guess what? It gives them power to say no to bad jobs, which in a competitive marketplace, employers should be competing for workers and therefore should be raising wages and offering decent benefits. Want people to come to work, pay them more, treat them better. Thank you so much, Dorothy Brown and Dorian Warren.